Hello and welcome to my talk, um, not only on synesthesia uh, and colour and music, but also how some of that has fed into my new commission tonight. So it's great to see you all. Um, so my name is Deborah Pritchard, um, and I'm a composer who has synesthesia. So a lot of my work is inspired by colour and artworks. Synesthesia um, is a neurological condition where one sense can influence another and differs in great detail from person to person. And in my case, it's a link between colour and intervals, the spaces in between the notes, um, rather than a specific key signature. And by way of showing you a little bit uh, of what that means is I tend to find um, that major thirds and minor thirds are warmer um, than other harmonies. Um, and Messian, French composer, also said, he said, you can warm a chord up by adding thirds and cool it down by adding fourths. Now, by way of example, when you hear harmony such as this, and then the triad that we all know, there's a warmth to that. But then, and this is very subjective for me, when I hear perfect fourths in succession, for me that feels a little colder, and fifths. And of course, there are so many subtleties in between all of this, but that gives kind of the basic idea of how I hear uh, warm and cold intervals. The seventh is a little bit different for me. There's a kind of iciness about that. The whole tone, again, a brightness and a luminosity that I think probably Debussy and a lot of the Impressionist composers would also feel. Um, so it's very subjective. I wouldn't expect someone to feel exactly the same thing. However, I think there are some universal understandings of intervals in that way. So moving on, um, I'd love to contextualise my way of thinking um, by looking back at the artist Kandinsky. And he wrote this wonderful book called Concerning the Spiritual and Art in 1910, uh, where he said himself, Colour is a power that directly influences the soul. Colour is the keyboard, the eyes are the hammers, the soul is the piano with many strings. The artist is the hand which plays, touching one key or another to cause vibrations in the soul. And furthermore, and I found this very, very interesting, and I have to admit also I hadn't realised that Kandinsky had written a book, so it's absolutely fascinating. Um, he thought that different colours had different personalities. And he said of yellow, yellow assails every obstacle blindly and bursts forth aimlessly in every direction. Yellow, if steadily gazed at in any geometrical form, has a disturbing influence and reveals in the colour an aggressive character. And then he goes on to say that yellow may be paralleled in human nature with madness not melancholy, but with violent, raving lunacy. Um, so very strong words there. He goes on to say that red is not as irresponsible as yellow, but it rings inwardly with a determined and powerful intensity. In music, he says that red is the sound of the trumpets. He says blue is like a cello. He says it's the typical heavenly colour. He says orange is like the notes of an old violin, like a man convinced of his own powers. And then he says that green was like the placid middle notes on the violin, the most restful colour that exists. And I found this very fascinating, because again, I think there are some things we all feel. Um, and certainly in my practice, um, as a composer, I will write music that's fully notated um, and conventionally written. In addition to that, I also create graphic scores, which are actually painted and should be um, interpreted very, very freely. Uh, and over lockdown, the London Symphony had to commission me to create a graphic score. Uh, and so I used uh, this paragraph by Kandinsky as the basis of my graphic score. So I sort of had yellow bursting out of its boundaries and um, green sort of floating. But of course, that was to be interpreted by musicians. And the fascinating thing is when 
musicians did interpret that, not knowing the Kandinsky quote, they brought some of the feelings that Kandinsky had to it, which was very, very interesting. So, and that particular piece is called Color Circle. So, Kandinsky wanted to evoke sound through sight, and he used color, line, and shape, and texture um, to create his own rhythmic visual experience. Um, and he collides forms and colors that seem to move across the canvas. And again, in, before I get to my songs, by contextualizing my way of thinking, um, this link to visual art goes back to ancient Greece, when Plato first talked of tone and harmony in relation to art and the spectrum of colors. Uh, the language of musical notation has long been arranged in progressive scales. And so Kandinsky's aesthetic supports my belief that these associations between color and sound shouldn't simply be dismissed because they are very subjective, but I think they do allow us to understand music at a, a different level. Um, other composers throughout history, Arnold Schoenberg in his dramatic work did look at a hand where color is notated through a series of abstract signs. Scriabin and Prometheus, the poem of fire, where he actually invented a new musical instrument called uh, clavier a luminaire, which would be played like a piano that projected colored light onto a screen. And of course, then we have Olivier Messian, who I've mentioned very briefly whilst I was at the piano, um, who has been a great influence on my work. And of course, with Messian, when he was writing, he, he didn't follow the emancipation of dissonance and the work of Schoenberg and serial technique. He wanted to create his own musical language, like in the same way that Lutislavsky did. And um, he created a lot of catalogues and um, books and treaties on, on what colour meant to him. And there's one particular work uh, that I would just like to mention called Couleur de la Cité Celeste, The Colours of the Celestial City, written in 1963. And Messian says in the preface to this piece, the form of this work depends entirely on colours. The melodical rhythmic themes, the complexes of sound and timbre, all evolve in the way of colours. In their renewed variations, one can find warm and cold colours, complementary colours, colours fading towards white or black. And he says one can compare these transformations with characters acting on several superimposed scenes. What's fascinating about this piece is Messiaen goes as far as to write the colours into the score and he says, I've noted the names of these colours in the score in order to impress this vision upon the conductor, who will in turn transmit this vision to the players he directs. It's very, very difficult to know if any musician could really play red or play blue. But I think the interest lies, perhaps taking Messian at his word, what are the results of this sound colour and how does this affect the form of the piece? And it feels to me that when you take Messian at his word, you can understand the piece at a far deeper level than otherwise perceived. And I think this is, this is very, very important. Um, so <clears throat> coming back to my work, um, I remember, I suppose it was back in 2008, um, I had this really incredible experience where <clears throat> I went to a, a church in Kent called Tubley Church, and it's actually wholly glazed in the work of Marc Chagall. So it's completely glazed in his work. Uh, and I went into the church and you just see a, a lot of very, very blue uh, colors, um, a lot of biblical themes, the Garden of Eden. But it's not until you turn around to go out that you're met with these dazzling golden windows. Um, and it provoked an emotional response in me. It felt like colour had actually moved me. Um, and I think that was almost the start of becoming more aware of colour in my music with synesthesia. And in a way, practising it and sort of purposely bringing it, bringing it into my work and how I'm writing. So 
Then now, on from that, um, one of my first larger works um, responding to colour was my violin concerto, where I worked in response to the painter Maggie Hamling. Um, and if you don't know Maggie's work, it's in all major British collections. Um, she's got a huge scallop in Albra Beach, which is hers, uh, which um, has words written saying, I hear those voices that will not be drowned. It's um, from the opera Peter Grimes of Benjamin Britten. And also she's got a sculpture of Oscar Wilde um, opposite Charing Cross, which you might see where he's lying down and it says, uh, you know, we are all in the gutter, but some of us look up to the stars. And she's an incredible artist. And one cold day in 2014, I, um, I went to see her with the violinist Harriet McKenzie. And uh, she sort of led us down a very muddy path to this outhouse where uh, her series of paintings, Walls of Water, were works in progress that she was soon to exhibit at the National Gallery in 2015. And she left us alone with them. Um, and the idea was that I was going to write a violin concerto in response to these paintings. Um, and these paintings were the sea kind of crashing towards you. Um, we're very used to seeing the hokusai sort of profile wave, but Maggie's work is like facing you. Um, it's quite extraordinary. And she painted throughout the year, so you get all the colours throughout the year, uh, going back to the idea of cold colours for winter and warm colours for the summer. So I was able to use... Um, those colours as a kind of guide uh, to my piece. And actually, talking about the violin, um, incidentally, um, it's actually important to say that perhaps the earliest example of image-influenced music were Bieber's um, Rosemary, uh, Rosary Sonatas for Solo Violin, written in 1676, um, that used this technique called scudatura, where you detune the violin. Um, to create very unusual sonorities, um, and each of these sonatas is prefaced by a devotional engraving. So again, a link to the uh, image with the violin. So, moving on from here, um, how does this all relate to my song cycle? Um, the song cycle, of course, I'm starting with words, um, and I think the words lead to images, to a sense of light and darkness. Um, with my work, it's not that every single piece has to be, you know, that's red, that's yellow, that's green. It's not like that at all. There's so many subtleties in between all of that. We're not just using intervals, we're using register and density and timbre and rhythm um, and tension and release. And um, I'm sure you all feel, when you feel yellow or light, it's, it's coming towards you, but then blue is receding away. You know, how does that all work in the sense of pulse and uh, time? So... I'm setting four poems by Henry Vaughan. The Morning Watch, uh, we have The World, um, we have Midnight and Peace. And the very first poem, The Morning Watch, uh, it, it says, O oh joys, infinite sweetness, with what flowers and shoots of glory my soul breaks and buds. So this idea that something's burgeoning, the soul the spirit, it's been asleep, but it's awaking. So for me, there is a darkness at the start of that. There is maybe a coldness that's yet to warm. Um, and I think that's where the coloristic sense of composition comes in. So when you hear that first song, um, there's a burgeoning energy that sort of rises up from the lower register, as if from the depths of the earth, but then kind of settles in the more luminous sound world while the voice then comes in using the fourth harmony that I demonstrated earlier, kind of colder harmony that then becomes warm by the addition of thirds. And I say that this is very much um, a kind of overview. There's so many more details within the harmonic language, you know, within that, but this gives you kind of the broad um, architecture, if, if you like, of it. Um, so this piece, this first opening song, um, is yet to find the light. It is coming from that darker place. Um, there's an energy that's yet to be harnessed. Um, we have this juxtaposition of intervals of fourths and thirds. Um, we have a repetitive uh, verse idea that comes back, um, but all is transformed. Uh, and in the very centre of the work, uh, we hear these words. In sacred hymns and order, the great chime and symphony of nature Prayer is the world in tune. 
a spirit voice and vocal joys whose echo is heaven's bliss. Oh, let me climb. And I find in her newborn, there's so many um, moments where he says, let me climb, or it was hurled, or it was risen, and there's, there's always this feeling of movement and moving onwards. So when I was setting the words, whenever I had a word like climb or, or hurled, um, I would always use that as the kind of the start of the next section of music. So you feel that the tension and release is always moving through um, the uh, composition, which is really important for me, is to get that real balance of tension and release, not only in rhythm and in meter, but also in uh, harmonic tension and release and, and timbre and register and the dialogue between the voice and the piano. Um, so we have this piece and it has this central section and almost palindromically you come back to the verse and the very end sort of just resolves upwards um, and, it, and it takes you to a slightly more spiritual place. Um, it doesn't end in a big way, it ends in very much we're going somewhere, it sets you on a journey. Then the next song, The World, I actually take an extract of this. This is a much longer poem by Henry Vaughan called The World, but I take just the very opening verse. Um, and it reads, I saw eternity the other night, like a great ring of pure and endless light, all calm as it was bright, and around beneath it, time in hours, days, years, driven by the spheres, like a vast shadow moved in which the world and all her train were hurled. And again, it's like everything was hurled into eternity, um, the energy and this moving forwards. And I approach this in a slightly different way. Um, I take through these lighter, more coloristic, warmer thirds. I take those through, I then use them vertically. I create something that's more recitative-like. Uh, more free, uh, whilst you have this almost mechanism of the first song, this one gives you space and it gives you light and it gives you, most importantly, resonance. And having the piano and the use of the pedal means that you can essentially, you know, have a succession of chords or notes that are just held on resonantly, um, just allowing us to have that echo effect. And that was particularly important um, in the line, like a vast shadow moved. Um, because when Ruby will sing that, um, just before we'd, we'd had this um, almost plummeting um, uh, sort of passage in the piano that, that again pedal down, the resonance is, you can almost feel the vibration of the resonance. And, and she sings that line and you almost feel that you can hear the shadow underneath her. Uh, because of this uh, sort of almost um, so something about this, this, this resonance that's just held there, which is very important. Um, and there's a darkness there too. Um, this piece, The World, the second song, um, in a similar way to The Morning Watch, the first song, um, ascends, but actually this time in contrary motion, the bass descends. So you have this kind of contrary motion opening up of this frame of register, if you like, with all this space in between, again, to somehow link into what is eternity and light and space and how can we even try to show that? And for me, it was about space resonance and somehow time stopping. Um, and again, I'm so privileged to be able to write for Ruby Hughes, who is so expressive and understands so clearly um, you know, what the words mean and, and what the intention is dramatically with, with this piece. Um, moving on to the third song in the cycle, um, Midnight. By heaven some say are a fiery liquid light which mingling eye streams and flames thus to sight. And again, with this one, as with the world, I have just taken an extract from this poem where the outer two are the full poems, um, so you have extracts inside. And this talks about fire and water, um, and again, this idea, in a way, of the spiritual nature of something just burgeoning and um, becoming almost like wind. It's, um, it's very, very exciting, and I, I've tried to, in a similar way to the world, write something slightly more free. I've brought back the use of force, but then I also have more modality, use of trills um, to show the light and the sort of shimmering effect. 
What's really important with this song, and it's a, a shorter one, this one, is at the very end, going back to resonance, um, instead of taking the pedal off at the end, um, Joan actually keeps it down. So you've got this build-up um, of, of all these sort of pitches harmonically. Um, again, that just stays there. And we go through Attacker uh, to the next song, which is um, the final song piece. So rather than starting in silence, we start against a sound world, um, which, which is there in the background. And it's really important to say that um, as I was writing this, and I was obviously getting on to the final song, um, it was important for me to have the last poem be about peace. Um, you know, the events in Eastern Europe were taking place, um, and it, I, I really felt that, you know, what, what can any of us do with so much going on in the world that, that is not about peace, that there's so much conflict, and even now, there's so much worry about what's going to happen in Eastern Europe, and I just wanted to write something that maybe gave, gave us a moment of peace and maybe hope um, was, was the intention with this work. Um, so it just leads through, and we come into more of a meditative state, um, a very well-known uh, text by Henry Vaughan, this, this last poem. My soul, there is a country uh, far beyond the stars, where stands a winged sentry, all skillful in the wars, and there above noise and danger, sweet peace sits, crowned with smiles. Um, and it, it's a beautiful poem, and uh, it, so I wanted to create the idea of this ascending to light. Um, the intervals that I used actually was slightly more chromatic, use of seventh. There was something about I wanted a light that was more bright and kind of closer um, and, and maybe with more uh, immediacy to it. And so this piece, it, it flows through in a very, very gentle way. And it's the only um, setting that ends with the voice. So the piano settles and the voice just holds on uh, a G sharp, um, which actually is an important tone link to the whole work. And so we return to this G sharp um, in a way perhaps to signify that there is hope um, that it, it, it moves on perhaps um, in a cycle onwards to somewhere else it hasn't quite finished um, and the intention is that um, that sense is, is created and one, just very very lastly, one important thing um, about that piece is I use a lot of palindrome, so a lot of mirror image in the phrasing you'll hear the opening phrase is unaccompanied it's actually a palindrome so it's always this kind of back and forwards and, and, and sense of uh, stasis and then my final point I would just love to comment on is that um, for me it's a very subjective thing I, I you know I'm not expecting all of you here to sort of hear and see and experience all these things it's a very subjective thing I'm sharing how it influences in my compositional practice gives you an idea into my way of thinking um, the tangible musical results of that are various technical things that will happen and hopefully will engage with the soul and, and have meaning and narrative and drama. Um, but I think the fact that I've, in a way, not practiced, but I've made it part of my language is important. And, and just with, to end on a bit of philosophy, um, the early philosopher David Hume supports this line of thought in his essay of the standard of taste where he says, though there naturally be a wide difference in point of delicacy between one person and another, nothing tends further to increase and improve this talent than practice in a particular art and the frequent survey or contemplation of the particular species of beauty. And in that very early essay from um, 1757, he actually talks about wine tasting being something that's essentially through practice, it can be something subjective can become objective. And it's one of the first times in philosophy they talked about this idea of essentially you know, practicing something that is subjective to make it more objective. So um, thank you so much for listening. Um, and uh, I'm privileged to be here at Leeds Leader and uh, to be working with Joseph Middleton and Ruby Hughes. And um, thank you for listening to me today.
uh, people like Messiaen and Scriabin seem to be sort of one-offs, you know, and, and maybe, I, I, I don't think Messiaen was strongly influenced by other composers. He, he developed his own thing. Now, I know there are people who've studied with Messiaen, like mm -hmm. George Benjamin, but, you know, w what was your uh, way into composing? Um, w were you a one-off or were you strongly influenced by other, other well, teachers and other composers? Yes. And it's in, you're right about Messiaen because, of course, you know, he, he didn't follow the Austro-German serial technique. He wanted his own musical language along with Lukaslowski and uh, he wrote the technique of my musical language and his posthumously published treaties and... Um, absolutely. A, a, and it has something as divine. He uses third song in Greek and Hindu rhythms and we all know quartets at the end of time and there is something that engages with the soul. I think his faith plays a part. And you're right, he's completely unique. Um, and... I think w with me it's actually an interesting path in many ways because I started music very late um, and actually my whole childhood was, my parents weren't musical, um, so I spent the whole time painting. Um, so I think that's probably where this comes from. When I started as a double bassist, I actually went to music college as a double bassist um, and then I changed completely to composition and in many ways I give thanks for the fact that I started very late because it meant that I, it wasn't just music music was everything, I was approaching things through other art forms and, and I think it's, sometimes I think we're so encouraged that you, you must be either music or you must be either art and actually I think humanities are more linked than we realise and it's very, very, I, I would like to think in the future that you didn't have to choose one or the other that actually, you know, places of education can broaden out more than they do. Um, uh, for me, very much about the intervals and uh, the line and um, I think we are all blessed as human beings to have completely unique DNA and fingerprint and voice, and I think it's just finding your voice and in, in, in some way encouraging younger composers. They don't need to worry about sounding like someone else because they are unique, and it's finding that way through, if that, if that makes sense. And yeah. So, as a late developer, yep. are you almost self-taught? Um, no, um, because uh, yes and no. Yes, w very much with art and how that links to music. My teacher, um, I studied with Robert Saxton, um, first of all at the Guildhall, I studied with Simon Bainbridge at the Royal Academy of Music, and then I did a PhD at Oxford with Robert Saxton again. So I went back to him, and of course, Robert, I studied with Berio and Elizabeth Lutchins, um, and um, he, he, Robert taught me to ta teach myself. Yeah. He taught me to understand. He said it's always about problem solving, um, and the things that he taught me, in a way, was to question myself. That's the answer, yes. You, I think in a way, there's that great story, isn't it, about Zanarchis who goes to Messian for a lesson and sort of says, well, I don't really sound like anyone else. And, and of course, he says, just be yourself. And of course, he was an architect and then wrote this extraordinary music. Um, uh, yes, so self-teaching self is a very, very important part of it. And being aware, very importantly, of what is functional in your music. Uh, what is it that carries the tension and release? Because now we're in, you know, 2022. It's not all it can be, but the tonality in your music is not necessarily the thing that's functional. And you have to work out what that is. Is it your harmony or is it more about timbre? Are you writing programmatic music or are you writing autonomous music purely for the beauty of the musical fabric of composition? You know, what does it mean to you? Is it about being human or is it something other than yourself? And I think it is important for the composers to know. And if they don't know, to be content that they don't know and, it, and, and be at peace with that, if that makes sense. It's just about that questioning, I think, is important. And any other questions? Yeah, okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>